One of the things that I've discovered about Tozer is that in his writings as well as in his teachings, in his personal life and in his way of arranging his life, he chose not to compromise. Irregardless of what it cost him, it didn't matter what the price he paid because when he wrote, he wrote the very oracles of God, so to speak, to pastors, to teachers, to elders, to people that would be reading his writings years after he was gone. And he had made the statement of being a prophet of God and that he was a minor prophet by his own admission, but that he felt God had laid on his heart such serious a message that he would be communicated to those that would be put in positions of authority. And in so doing, that makes his reading of a lot of his material very precise. He had a very insightful way of looking directly at the issues and the problems involved in the heart of man, in the reality of who we are every day, in the very aspect of what we say we are and then what we actually do. Because you see, it's easy for any man, woman, or child to say something, to profess to be something. But confession is good and it's good for the soul. But what shows and demonstrates the person you are is by your actions living out the words that you speak. The two go hand in hand, for you don't have one without the other. And the reality of something that I've just recently seen in my life is that we're told that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, and that whatever is inside of our heart reveals really by our words what is in there. And we're told that the heart is deceitful and perverse and wicked and deceitful. And out of it comes vile things and lust and all these vicious, evil desires. And recently I just heard out of the abundance of the heart someone's mouth speak. And so I share that with you, not wanting to cause controversy because he is a man of God and he is used in a big mega ministry. And I don't want to, you know, disagree with every male I know in the universe or every male I know personally, but frankly, we're talking about sin. Because you see, recently there was just this new idea that comes out that isn't really new, it's old and it's been used for a long time and not really addressed too often in common conversation. Because you see, in common conversation, we don't want to admit our little, little secret, you know, daddy's little secret or mommy's little, you know, shh, don't talk about. You know, all the little, ooh, we don't talk about that. The marriage bed is undefiled, so we don't go there. You know, all things are lawful to me, but not all things are expedient, so I can do what I want as long as it's in the context of marriage. We don't talk about that area of life whereby a man and a woman ought to be accountable to God for their actions and reactions, their interaction with each other. Because some people call it sex, and they try to make it into just a perfunctory action that doesn't involve the spirit and the soul. They want to make it only a physical action with a reaction of satisfaction. You see, that's all they see it as. An action with a reaction for personal satisfaction. That's it. Hey, I know I'm saved, so let me get away with whatever I want to do. And never mind what I'm doing to you as long as it makes me feel good. Or I can make you feel good. But then reciprocity, of course, you want to make me feel good. Because after all, we're feeding our flesh and we want to feel good with our flesh, don't we? Never mind that we are to crucify the flesh and the lust thereof. So I question in my mind, especially after reading Tozer and doing a teaching from Tozer, which is what we do, because we want to, we want to examine ourselves, my own mind, my own heart, my own sinfulness, my own guilt in this area of my life. And we want to throw it out to the world and say, I am as guilty as every other man in the world for I am a sexual pervert, aren't you? Don't you have those lusts? Don't you have those visions or those envisionings? If I say oral sex, what do you picture? And yet, we have a great man of God now teaching, oh, hey, you know what? Oral sex is okay, but if your conscience bothers you, nope, don't do it, because after all, hey, let your conscience be your guide, you know? Man, you know, if you're doing it, go for it, as long as you're married, you know, inside of marriage, it's okay, but you know what? <laughs> Don't want to talk about it, don't want to get into it, just let your conscience be your guide. Let my God be my guide, okay? Because that's how real it is. 
Because, my God, what are we doing? What are we really doing? Aren't we just making up excuses to do what we want to do anyways? Aren't we just using the Word of God to excuse our pervert nature that we are? Haven't we taken the glory of the incorruptible God and make him to the image of corruptible man so that we could change what he intended for a man and woman into some kind of, dare I say, dog-like actions? Or should I say even worse, priestesses from some other God, some other religion, some other nature? Did you know that there was a time when the children of Israel were coming into the land, they were coming into the Canaanites, and Baal and Balaam and Balak were getting together and they wanted to curse the children of Israel. They wanted to cause them to stumble or actually be wiped out is what Balak wanted, but Balaam was a prophet of God and the only thing that he could do was every time that he went to curse them, he blessed them. Every time he went to curse them, he blessed them. So instead he says, look, I can't do anything except God tells me to do. But I can tell you how you can get the children of Israel in trouble. Get the priestesses from the temple. You know, the ones that, you know, they do Kama Sutra, they do Tantra, they do everything else, you know, all these sexual acts that, you know, we all enjoy that. Of course, you know, we're men, aren't we? You know, whenever you wanted to learn some new sexual technique, you went to one of the priestesses in the temple because, after all, they were there for the gratification of the flesh. They knew all these different ways to enjoy perversion because that's what sensuality, actually sexuality was what it was all about and that's what they did in order to worship their God. And you can see it manifested in all the historical records because that's where it came from. That's where it started. But what were the children of Israel like? Oh my God! For this cause shall man and the woman, God made marriage for the children of Israel. He didn't make like this multiple idealism of, you know, multiple breasts, you know, in order to worship the God, where do you think that comes from? Perversion of one action and one definite creation into something perverted. Where do you think that all of our ideas come from if they're not from deities that once existed way back at a time when God tried to take the children of Israel through a life experience that they're going to reveal what we would be like? Because in our nation, too, what were we like at one time when we had the Puritan way of looking at life? Because after all, right now, is it in America? There's such a big idealism about, oh, our Puritan fathers, oh, the people that came over, oh, they were so righteous. Or were they? You see, God, in the beginning, created man and woman. He created Adam and Eve. Out of the dust, he created man figures because we got a dirty mind anyways. So once man fell, of course he had a dirty mind. <laughs> I'm just playing with you, so to speak. But what happened was that when man was found to not have found a mate, God created woman from a rib and fashioned, not from his side, not so that she could walk beside, not from behind him and not from in front of him. None of those apply. That's not what the scripture says. He took a rib and formed her fashioned her with his own hands, designed her specifically to be a helpmate for him. So they would be companions. Because, you see, as God walked in the midst of them, between them even, they walked with him. In the cool of the day, God walked with Adam and Eve. Well, it says Adam, but of course, where was Eve then? Sitting back in the garden waiting to be tempted? I don't think so. So you see, Eve being in love with Adam or being fashioned for Adam, together they walked. And they were in the garden and we don't know how long. And they walked with God and we don't know how long. But the point of it is this. Let me ask you a few questions so that you understand before we read the devotional exactly where we're coming from when we talk about sensuality, sexuality, and all of this. When God created Adam and Eve, they had a body, a soul, and a spirit. A body, a soul, and a spirit. And the body, the soul, and the spirit became one. And Jesus made that very obvious when he said that when you join yourself to a woman, know ye not that the two become one? Echad? Communion of body, soul, and spirit. So if you joined yourself to a hooker, or a whore, or a prostitute, then you have joined your spirit and soul and body to that. Think about it. You have 
prostituted yourself into a prostitute spiritually you have committed spiritual fornication literally you have so fully enjoying yourself to that completely so how do you come out of that well again it's the same thing as repentance forgiveness and mercy you don't crucify Christ again you ask God to forgive you and to make you anew but you have to recognize what you've done and the consequences of your actions because if you join yourself to what a prostitute dare I say that you will suffer some consequences so let's get real about it now besides that aspect of it just the idea of body soul and spirit what about in the fallen nature do we actually see another person as a human being or do we see another person as a temple of the Holy Spirit oh wait a minute we don't talk about the temple of the Holy Spirit when we're having sex because after all it's sex it's that action for a satisfaction we call it reaction hello we're there for an orgasm not for a spiritual union of a body soul and spirit are we because you see God wants to be involved in every aspect of your life and if you don't want him involved in every aspect of your life walk away now because you don't want to hear what I have to say I'm serious I'm dead serious one of the things that I know that I have to deal with that I have to chastise myself I have to beat my body down with it's a reality in my mind I'm a pervert and so are you because I know you if you're a man I know my mother used to have a very famous expression that you know all guys used to laugh at because they thought she was the funniest thing in the world because she was a truck stop waitress she says hey if you want to make a man happy it only takes one thing and all she has to do is get on her knees and the truth was literally guess what whether it be a president or whether it be a pastor or whether it be a rabbi you can see it in every aspect of life the male fornication aspect of his own temptation is always manifested in one aspect that he always seems to give himself away to and that seems to be oral sex so let's be real what are you doing now let's just let's just conform this into the image of the incorruptible God for a minute okay let's just get back to the reality of what you're doing with God himself because you see if you're doing it to a Christian you're doing it unto me Jesus said so in as much as you've done it to the least of my brethren you've done it unto me so let's be real for a second what you O oh man are doing to Jesus what am I as a male as a human being but also as the temple of the Holy Spirit also as being a example of a godly man what am I doing? This is the woman that God gave you, that you will present faultless before the Father with exceeding joy, that you've been given a temporary time to enjoin yourself to her, to become one in body, in soul, and spirit. To she has been brought to you to help meet you with God, to help you meet the day, to help you meet the soul, to help you meet the spirit, to help you meet the requirements of the flesh, to help you meet everything that's in your life and to bear children as God has given her a miracle of creation to participate in and you get to participate in that miraculous event that God has initiated within a man and a woman and God himself do you realize that in the conjugal connection between man and woman there is body soul spirit and God so what are you doing what are you doing with your member so to speak if you're talking about oral sex let's be real how could you come up with that unless you had seen it somewhere how could you come up with that unless you had heard it somewhere because if you were a normal logical person let's be real first of all you're not going to go out and take care of your body issuances and go to the restroom and then turn around and think that you're going to do what to a woman excuse me that doesn't sound if you were just being innocent and had never known and been through a 60s revolution where we try everything and do everything and if you weren't a pervert if you weren't changing the image of the incorruptible God into the image of corruptible man and changing what God intended man to be, then guess how you would be if you were just pure in his sight. Would you look at her being as a temple of the Holy Spirit and do what you do to her? Would you? Or would you look at her face to face? Would you want to enter into the holy place face to face? And don't try to make that into some kind of perversion because then you just prove Romans that you change it the glory of the incorruptible God into the image of corruptible man you have lowered the standard that God set which was so far above you you don't even understand that you can still enjoin yourself to a spiritual union when you have 
interlocution of the body, soul, and spirit by the union of the joining of the flesh. Did you know that? Your soul has become interlocuted with that person. It has become interconnected. You are now bound with that other person in soul. Never mind what happens to the spirit. Because I dare say that you probably aren't ready for it. So let's just go there. Could it be that you could enjoin yourself more than you know now in some selfish, self-satisfying gratification that you're looking for into copulation? Or could you see that the interlocution of your body, soul, and spirit would cause you to enjoin yourself to even something bigger than what you think is the big O because you got the big G and the big D behind it? Let's get real. You're missing out on the full spectrum. You've only got one little O and I've got a big G, a big D, and a big O in between. I get to experience the entire thing because I'm willing to treat my spouse, my person that God has allowed me the privilege of being with, I'm willing to enjoin God in the act of being one with her and I as we see each other, as we see Jesus in each other's eyes. Where do you go with that? Do you go right down into the gutter? Because you see, that's what the world wants you to do. That's what this famous pastor wants you to do. He really wants you to just say, hey, you know, let your conscience be your guide. After all, you can program that. Do you didn't know that? You didn't know you could program your conscience to be any way you want it to be? You could transform your mind by the renewing of it, or you could change it by the hardening of it. Because you see, if our conscience convict us, the greater is he that is in us than our conscience, because that's one way that you can prove that the conscience is susceptible to change, because it says that, hey, the word of God is greater than your conscience. So it can cause you to be forgiven in a way when your guilty conscience can't allow you to forgive yourself. But in the negative aspect, it can also lead you down a perversion trail, which I do believe this sin that has been so easily brought to men to get away with is so acceptable to now men, women, and children because they're all doing it, aren't they? Because it's not just oral sex that a man is getting satisfaction from. Now it's oral sex for women. Oral sex for what? Homosexual. Let's be real. What else is going on? Homosexual between man and child. What else is going on? Do you see the perversion trail that you're going? Do you see how Romans said it all from the very beginning? It isn't just the idea of, oh, well, we're calling it missionary position and we're sticking with it because, after all, it's only for missionaries. No, it's called God. And when you look at God and you see it in a woman's eyes, then you know where you're at. If you look at God and look, or if you look at a woman's eyes and you see her as a sexual object for your self gratification, or you're trying to cause her some satisfaction, then you've missed the whole point. You don't know what creation is about. You don't know what you are. You are a son of God. You are a temple of the Holy Spirit. You are someone who has taken yourself as the image of the incorruptible God and you have lowered your standards to become a dog. Worse than animals. You become a created being that hasn't risen up or rose up to the level that God wants to bring you. You're still dealing, frankly, with everyone that's outside of the kingdom of God. You're still enjoining yourself by your actions to what can only be described as the temple priestesses. That in every culture, every culture in the world, not Christian, every culture in the world, they had perverted sexual practices. Why? How could they? What is so enticing about this sexual deviation that every country in the world, except when Christianity was there, would have it? And now, every Christian country in the world is getting it. Because we're no longer pure. We're no longer thinking about, hey, we need to talk about this in the context of God and his word, we're trying to make Song of Solomon fit something that it doesn't fit. We're trying to make this into that and we can get this from that and we can make rabbinical Judaism as our example and then we'll say Song of Solomon is something that we can do, you know, so we can go ahead and play sexual perverts with anyone we want to because the marriage is on the file. Oh, oh, not going to go there. Can't talk about it. Sorry. You know. I've seen Christians selling sex toys. I've seen Christians acting as though we need to gratify women. I've seen Christians doing everything except putting God in the middle of it. Because you're embarrassed. Because you're ashamed. 
And I know you are. Because you know I'm right. And even if you disagree with me, you know the scripture says that person is a temple of the Holy Spirit and you know the Holy Spirit is in them and you know that Jesus is in them and you know that in as much as you've done whatever you did to that woman or man, you did it unto Jesus. And if you're a pervert, then you might think that's cool. But I don't. Because you're doing it to my God. And that's why I speak. The only reason I bring this up isn't because I'm innocent. I've been the deviant. I've been the pervert. As a matter of fact, I still fight that temptation that I've given into in the past. And I know to this day that even in my mind, I have to put my flesh, my soul, and my spirit on that cross. Because as I do, then I can fight that imagination that is in my mind that I can't remove because I am paying the consequences of my sin. So where do you begin? Do you just go on with what you're doing? Well, you know, I'm forgiven, so I just go ahead and keep doing it. Hey, everybody's doing it. Good. Then don't read this. Don't pursue God in a more intimate and personal way. Because once you know the truth, then the truth not only sets you free, it also puts you into conflict with who you are. Because the reality of knowing this truth and factual data from God as you apply it to your life is going to cause a conscience and an issue of conscience. You're going to have to sit down and think about it. You're going to have to sit down and talk to God about it. And I don't even want to be there for when He talks to you because I've already been there. I know what I had to do and I was ashamed. I had to literally put myself in the position of imagining the unimaginable. And you know what I mean. If you don't, use your imagination. And that's disgusting. That's abomination. That's perversion of the worst kind. And yet, that's what we do. That's what I did. That's how I'm set free. And that's how I share with you the only way that you'll ever understand what I'm saying to you. Because when you get someone like a big pastor out there that says, well, you know, for conscience sake, you know, if you're, you know, if you're enjoying it and it doesn't bother you, then go ahead. <sighs> Excuse me, dude. I have a Bible, first of all. And I can go through the Bible and already put together just a few scriptures like I shared with you and show you just how easy it is to understand who that woman is and what you're doing to her, or man is, because I'm talking to men mostly, because I already know that, you know what, without a man pushing it, it ain't going to happen. Now women, they could probably, you know, back off some, you know, and gradually we could teach them because they're teachable. Men usually aren't because they're going to try to blame it all on something else and get away with what they're doing anyway because they've been hiding it for centuries. They won't deal with the aspect of being a pervert. And I, my mother used to say it, all men are perverts. Well, I used to say to her, Bob, all men are perverts. All men are liars and truth's not in them, but, you know. <laughs> but perverts, I don't know about, you know, because some men are godly and, you know, they, they go in the right direction. She says, not in my book. And I was like, well, Mom, you know, I think God's going to work on you with your conscience, you know. And I don't know if she ever did change her opinion. <laughs> but, you know, such as it is, grace applies and forgiveness, but... All I can say is, there is hope. Because if you could now get off of what you lowered God to being and degraded the very act of copulation into some sexual gratification so that you have an action for your satisfaction, a reaction for your satisfaction, then instead of that, you could be filled with a spiritual union. Imagine this, what if on the day of creation all the angels participated with the Son of God and God himself when God caused creation to burst forth in an orgasmic explosion of creative process that God made the universe into. He had to have our actions coming from somewhere and they have to mean something when life is created, when a man and a woman join together. What do you think creation is? It's not just the spiritual with the physical. I believe with all my heart that in six days there was such a wild 
We don't even have a word for it that exploded the universe into being. Literally. And so it shall be that if we, in a minor way, we take the reality of God into our quote-unquote copulation, then we would find that as we learn how to grow in the area of the spirit, grow in the area of the soul, grow in the area of the physical, we wouldn't go perverted. We would begin to lift each other up into an aspect of joining ourselves to the spirit of God, to God himself, to Jesus in that person, and we would become echad, a unity that goes beyond explanation of some orgasmic physical experience you think you have because of some emotional overload of jangling nerves. Please, if you only get a physical reality, you're missing out on the spirit and the soul. Hello? You only get one-third of what you could have. I want all of it. I'm not satisfied with one-third. So if you're like some kind of, you know, like deviant and you just want one-third of it, go away. But if you want two-thirds more, whoo <laughs> Man, have I got news for you. It gets better. But you got to go his way, not your way. Because if you go your way, you're going downhill, just like Roman says. And you started off maybe as just, you know, well, we just wanted to experiment. And now where are you? Be real. Be real with your life in Jesus. You started off maybe just a little trying something. And then where did you go? It wasn't enough, was it? You kept going down that road. And now, just like Romans says, they took the image of the incorruptible God and changed it into corruptible God, changed the natural order. What's the natural order? Come on, give me a break. You already know the natural order. Face to face, you look at each other. What is natural when the two people begin to even love each other and kissing? You're kissing each other, and what do you do? You just automatically, you're right there, so guess what happens? Bingo! Doesn't take a genius to figure that one out. You don't have to roll over and kiss her on the back. No, you roll over and kiss her on the front. You kiss lip to lip. Eye to eye, face to face, so let's be real. You know what we're talking about. You want to call it missionary? I don't. I call it God's natural order. And that's what it is. The natural order of things. But instead, if you want to change it into unnatural, go ahead. But you know where you're going. Because you've been down that path and you've already seen where you were to where you are. I remember the day. I remember the day very well. As a matter of fact, I still get goosebumps over remembering that day. But I remember as a young man, the first time I put my hand in another woman's hand, that was a stranger to me, someone I really cared about. And I remember holding her hand, and I had goosebumps up and down my back. It was one of the most emotional experiences I ever had. You can't tell me that's copulation, but I can tell you that's a soulful joining of a woman and a man. And I can tell you that it was beyond anything that I had experienced a long time, except for my first kiss. So remember the first kiss. Remember the first hand. Remember the first time. That's what God is saying. It's not just a physical thing. There's a soulful aspect. Now, let's go farther. What if you involved your spirit as a born-again Christian? What if you could? What if you began to get there? What if you began to experience it like God intended from the beginning? I wrote about it. I wrote it in a book called Genesage about this unbelievable experience of Echad and praise the Lord, you know. It's something that I've been teaching about for a long time, but I finally had to put myself on the cross and say, you know, Michael, if you're going to say anything in front of the camera, you better be doing it. Because if you're not, you better repent. Pat Robertson literally put me on the spot because he came out from the camera and said, hey, you know what? Oral sex is fine between a husband and a woman, you know? Marriage bed's undefiled, you know, and, and you know, whatever, you know, conscious sake, blah, blah, blah. So I'm putting him on the spot. No, it's not. It never has been, never will be, and if you want to be a pervert, go ahead. All things are lawful to you, Pat Robertson, and all things may be expedient, and you can do whatever you want to do in your relationship with God, but I know this, that what God intended from the beginning, you may say, it is written, but I say unto you, this is what God intended from the very beginning, that man and woman should join together as spiritual beings, body, soul, and spirit communing as one face to face. Don't tell me about oral sex, that's perversion, period. God's voice still entreats lost mankind. 
For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and travails in pain together until now. Romans 8, 19 and 22. Listen to that. For the earnest expectation of the creature waits for the manifestation of the sons of God. What are you manifesting in every moment of your day? You go ahead and tell me, you know, in oral sex what you're manifesting, and I'll tell you what I see. Because manifesting means what are you showing people? What are you demonstrating in that moment when all the angels in heaven are watching you? When God himself is looking down and sees you? When Jesus is inside you and he is very well aware of what you're doing? You know, and the Spirit of God dwells within you and he is also participating. What are you doing in that moment of oral sex? Because they know. Now, let me ask you this. In your moment, whichever part you are, of that other person, what are you doing to that person? And what is that person? Are they full of the Holy Spirit? Is that Jesus inside them? Is everyone watching them too? And you're participating in that? God help us. For we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. God help us. We're all perverts. We have suffered the consequences because we have sown to the wind from the 60s a sexual revolution and we've reaped the whirlwind of it. It has invaded the church and destroyed the sanctity and the sanctimonious idea that God is real. Instead, now it should have been God has always been real. But no, that was called sanctimonious. That was called as though, no, you're just trying to be you know, one up on everybody. No, I'm trying to say God's real. And he's in you. And what are you doing with them? The manifestation of the sons of God are those that have God in them. Why is it that the shining world of which men have dreamed and that every man secretly believes is somewhere before him is nevertheless lost to men? It can only be because we are out of the way. We are not in the way. We are not followers of the way. We are not doing what Jesus said was the way. I am the way. The world we inhabit is a lost world. It is a sick, fallen planet upon which we ride. The sacred revelation declares plainly that the inhabitants of the world are also lost by a mighty, calamitous visitation of woe which is still upon them to this day. But with this, it also tells us of a glorious fact that this lost race has not been given up on. Thankfully, there is a voice that calls, a voice that entreats, a voice crying out in the wilderness, a voice even as you hear as I speak, one crying out to you, to God in you, from God in me. Where are we? If we were not lost, there would be no voice behind us saying, this is the way, walk ye in it. If it were acceptable, I would be silent and we would agree on getting what we want, oral sex. It's legit now. Somebody said we could. We can invent it out of scripture. Sure, we can come up with it. We can come out with it. We can invent our own reasons in religion. But in relationship, what did God tell you? What is Jesus telling you today? What is Jesus saying to you now? All of his entreating calls blend into one, whether it be the voice of God's love, or the voice of Jesus' blood, or the voice of conscience, or the voice of the dead, or of the living, or of the lost of the saved. So the holy writer says that the lost planet is full of vanity and has lost its meaning, crying like a woman in travail and waiting, as it were, to be born again into the liberty of the sons of God and saved from decay and corruption. How dare we? How dare we as men of God? How dare we as teachers, pastors, elders, deacons? Spiritual leaders in our own home? Oh, we're spiritual until we get into bed. Is that the way it is with your life? You see, I know that even as I share this, there are... Yeah, there are... I know as I share this, there are souls that wouldn't even think of doing what we're talking about. They don't even have a clue, really, as to what we're saying. 
because they refuse to participate in the world and its ways. They abhor anything that would pervert the image of God and they do all to exalt him in all of their life lifting him up in every way they can with all their soul, being, mind and strength I only know that because God says so not because I've seen it because you see the men I run into are perverts and I don't know one that is yet I haven't found one that isn't yet I expect there is some maybe but you know if there's hope in salvation then there's hope for sanctification then we know that God in us who changes us from image to image from glory to glory into the image of the incorruptible God is taking us from that corruption step by step inch by inch slowly but surely away from that corrupted actions that we do to a complete realization of who he is. Maybe this was tough on you. Good. Maybe this isn't like the laughter and joy that you normally hear from a video. You're right. It's a teaching. It's from Tozer. It's the reality of God speaking to us and saying, grow up. You've been like little children playing with dogs and now you act like dogs. You even call it that. You've been like those temple priestesses acting like prostitutes and you prostituted your spirit and soul for what? Your flesh? What are you doing as light and children of the light? What are you revealing as men and women of God? What are you concealing when you say the marriage bed is undefiled and now you don't talk about what's behind the doors because they're closed? What is your dirty little secret that you're keeping hidden behind? The grace you have and the mercy. What is it that you think God doesn't see or that you're unwilling to talk about to the Son of God who lives in that other person that you just had? oral sex with it. God help us because we need help each and every one of us